Incognito from Posted on the Corner tapping in. Hot 107.9 and Remy Martin. We're about to do something special today. Live from Main Street Studios. We're going to mix it up ATL. Talk about this mixtape culture. We're going to tap in with some of the greatest influencers from the city. Grab your bottle. Let's do it. What to do, world? This is your big homie, DJ Hershey. OG DJ Hershey represents his ATL for real, man. And we mix it up right here with Remy Martin and Incognito. Negro. <laughs> All right. So, how has the mixtape capacity grown within the strip club nature? Starting off, starting off here in '91. I'm giving my age right now. '91, um, the strip clubs got the underground music first, and I didn't see the two chains, the Jeezys. The outcasts, the kilos, they was bringing the music to us first. So the DJs in the strip clubs was getting it first, and we was just putting it on mixtapes. Mixtapes back then was outselling really the major labels, man. They had a problem with that because we was we was putting it on the tape first and and putting it in the streets, and people was dubbing it. So. The sales on the mixtapes in the streets was outselling their record labels, and record labels had a problem with that. So it, it just grew to a big, how I want to say, let me start all over to, to, to explain it. Put it like this. Say Outkast dropped a single first, and they wanted to test the record out. Well, the DJs do, we'll get it, we'll keep it. Keep, well, back then was Wax Records. So what we'll do, we'll have a test record, we'll keep it. They say, don't put it out, we'll put it out, put it on the mixtape. And, and it just blew up like that, man. So that, that the marketing back then, let's say marketing, marketing strategy was like through the mixtapes, through the strip clubs. Radio, PDEs, and run the streets. So they relied on the DJs in, in, the, um, in the strip clubs to, to let them know what was hot. Take, for instance, Future. I remember with a PD came to visit me. At the time, it was, uh, who was that? And then, was it Jerry Smoking B? Shit, I done went to like four or five PDs. So, <laughs> that's crazy, man. And I'm still in radio. You <laughs> feel That's over 23 years. Okay, say, um, give an example of what I'm talking about, a mixtape of how it grown. Future. He wouldn't have even been on radio if the PD, whichever one it was, I ain't gonna, you know, whichever one it was, could have been Hurricane Dave, could have been Jerry Smoking B. Could have been Steve. By the fact it was, uh, was it Hurricane Day? One of them, Smoking Bee. But anyway, we doing we doing um, um, Future. I was playing a song by Future. The PD came up say, well, well, who the hell is that? I like his Future, man. You know what I'm saying? I ran the record back. He had the I had the crowd, the girls dancing. The next day, that shit was in radio. I was like, damn, you know what I'm saying? Then another example of how the mixtape grown, Outkast. It just say like bootlegs, man. Bootlegs are everywhere. I drop a mixtape. Edward J drop a mixtape. The Oom Count drop a mixtape. Everybody playing the same thing. They riding around the city. Really, that's how we broke records, man. And the mixtape came about. Uh, so that's pretty much, pretty much, if I can explain it like that, pretty much from my ex perspective on how a game like that. That was solid. So the next question would be, how has the mixtape culture of ATL impacted the world or the industry? Well, first, New York, California, we weren't respected in the South as like a New York artist or or a or, or, or East Coast artist, a West Coast artist. It was different. They didn't think that the Southern culture could rap like that. So I saw, I saw this, I saw when, when um, Outkast first. Man, I'm looking at you again. I saw when Outkast first um, went to New York and performed. How they dissed them. How they dissed us. We couldn't get no play in New York. Couldn't get no play in Cali. And then, um, boom, Outkast blew up. They found that we could rap. Then came Lil John, the Crunk area. The Crunk Era, and then um, 
it just took off from there, man. It just took off from there. I just I just want to say that uh, Outkast, the Kilos, the Booty Shake, the Uncle Luke's gave us the recognition that 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 we needed for the South, and and we got the respect now that we do, cause at at first all all you heard was New York Puff Daddy and 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 Biggie, no disrespect, and Tupac's and all that. Then here come Outkast with their lyric, lyrical flow, and Kilo. And Raheem, I can't leave him out. Raheem, the dream, it's just the culture, man. It all came together. Now you got the people up north on some southern type tracks. And we just took over from that, man. I say the crunk era, the first one that started was Outkast and Kilo. After Outkast and Kilo came that crunk. Then after that crunk, then you got your little trap with, with uh, Jeezy and T.I. and Pastor Troy's. All that came about, man. Now we got mad love and respect through the whole the whole world, man. Yeah, that's right. Raheem and Kilo. Raheem and Kilo. The first rapper that made the mainstream in Atlanta was uh, Mojo. You probably don't know about Mojo. He he was a uh, it was like uh, some kind of like uh, booty shape. He was on the FM station, um, at AM station. It was at thirteen eighty. That was on the AM. Back then, you had. Uh, you had your uh, Ryan Cameron, which was on V103. Then you had DJ Nabs, was mixing on uh, Ryan Cameron's show. It was called The Fresh Party. And But uh, the first rapper that I give props to before the outcast was Mojo. He had a song called Stump, Jump, and Twist. And he put put Atlanta on the map as well, too. So I got to give a shout out to to him. And he stills alive. He's still alive. Then came the, uh, well, Shadi's from New York, so he don't count. He just moved to the South and, and got uh, a little taste of this Southern flow. So though he came in, in the base, but shout out to Outkast and Kilo in the Oom Camp. Couldn't have been without the Oom Camp with the mixtapes. And also uh, King Elwood J. He had a line of mixtapes. He was doing it like Master P was dropping albums every month, but they was doing it every week. They had like eight DJs. You had DJ Smurf, Kids of Rock. Bonet, DJ Lynn, DJ Man, DJ Smurf, which now it's called Mr. College Paul. Uh, who else was over there? Um, I'm leaving out one person. I know he's going to be mad at me, but it's all good. Uh, yeah, about it. Shout out to Monte, DJ Jelly, MC Assault, myself, of course. Oh, Drama came in to see later on. But he's not from Atlanta either. But I give a shout out to Drummer for, for doing that thing. We had a birthday bash. This is how Gangster Grill came about. Lil John, they was at the station. They needed a drop for the tape that Sense had made and Drummer made to pass out that birthday bash. So Lil John, of course, Gangster Grizzle. He put that drop, Sense put it in the tape, and there you have it. Gangster Grill, that's how it came about on the birthday bass. I forget what era that it was, but that's how it came about. Gangsta Grill. So that's a little taste of, of the mixtape coach in Atlanta too, so. That hard. Tell them about uh, your home base strip club. We can find you at whenever we in the A-Town. Man, let me tell you, I've been a legend. I've been doing my thing. Blue Flame, that was started. I started the Blue Flame in 91. I was a young buck then. I left Blue Flame in 2015. Uh, I had a conflict of interest with a new club that opened up and gave it butt naked and raw. I had a strip, uh, a conflict of interest with my boss said. He wanted me the prime time to itself. So I took the opportunity of, well, I'm going to expand my brand. So I did Diamonds of Atlanta. Kevin Hart, they did the grand opening. My boss felt some type of weight. Sorry about that, Mike, but I'm putting it out there. Um, he felt some type of weight saying there was a conflict of interest. And he fired me, let me go. That way, then I took, from there, the guys that did Diamonds of Atlanta, they had some some dealings with the, the law enforcement. They got locked up, so they closed the club down, new owners. Now it's called uh, DOA. What's it called now? Diamonds, Diamonds of Atlanta still? No. But anyway. Then I went to Magic City. I did all the strip clubs, bro. Magic City, I did Magic City for two years. I did Onyx for a year. And now I'm at uh, Peaches of Atlanta. What's up, Nard? Shout out to Nard. That's at the West End, the heart of the city, baby. 
You can find me right there. Monday through Saturday, baby. Doing my thing. And also on Hot 107.9. Man, I've been on Hot 107.9 since 98. You never heard a mixer mixing that long on the airways. I done did it all. Morning show. Midday mix. 9 o'clock cut up. They had me. I was mixing so so good. Check this out. They met my own show at 12 midnight called the Quickie Mix. <laughs> it's crazy, man. I was mixing nonstop, man. I was in the morning with Ryan. And then they had, uh, what's it, Ryan? Yeah. 18, Cersei, man, I, I did it all, man. So I call myself an OG legend, still in the game, still doing my thing, man. And you can catch me right now at 12 o'clock every Tuesday. Every Tuesday, man, from 12 to 1. That's what I'm doing. And I got some other surprises, too, coming, too. Ain't listen to them? This when Gucci and, and Jeezy was still partners. I can tell you a story about Gucci, man. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Gucci, man, brought that record so icy to me. Yeah. Fresh, I still got the CD, dog. Yeah. Brought that shit straight to me to goddamn the atrium. He said, he was high behind the curtain. Yeah. I played it. He was like, Hershey, what they doing to her? I said, man, this shit off the chain, yeah. bro. Yeah. I was like, man, this shit off the chain, Gucci. He like, man, I appreciate that, bro. Everybody that been solid with me, Including Jeezy. I remember Jeezy with a little shot. He might hit me for it, man. You used to come in the other day, see this girl named Snuggles. I know that was your boot thing back in the day. Had his pant leg rolled up with a backpack on. But he was still about that life, though. And then um, BMF, they came around. And uh, I did things at the agent with them. After I was spot from 3 to 10 in the morning. BMF, I have never seen, no disrespect to Westside, my Danny boys. And I have never seen... An individual, a mob like that, come through a strip club. Listen, man. They come in. If you want to stay in here, if you want to leave, you can. But right now, the doors are closed. They spend twenty, thirty thousand on buying the club out, dog. All drinks for free. You didn't have to buy no table dance, no nothing. All you had to do was just sit there and have a good time. Unless you was a baller yourself. But Meech, man, uh, free Meech, man. That's all I gotta say, man. And um, they changed the game for the whole, the whole scene in the strip club, man. The red carpet, I mean the green carpet that came from them guys. Uh, they were some killers for real, though. But uh, other than that, anything else you want me to talk about? Bro? <laughs> 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 the last thing he said, there was some killers for real. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, man, mad love to Jeezy and, and Gucci, man. I'm glad they squashed their beef as well. But uh, other than that, man, but BMF was like no other. But like, and it was, like he said on them videos, there would never be another mob like that ever. And they was good people, dog. They was genuine. You need anything, bro? They got you. I'm gonna give you a quick story, right quick. I was at the atrium. Jesus was on the stage, you had J-Bo, all, the whole BML, Meech, everybody. I'm DJing, I'm going out. He was like, man, this man gave me about, I think it could have been eight grand, man. I want BMF all night. I said, man, by me, you know, I'm making money. I gave this shit back to him. That's how I got respect from them guys, I gave it back to him. Like, no, Hershey. I said, gotcha. So I paid some Baby D, ba Baby D, I played some Blue Da Vinci. Of course, I, I killed that Jeezy. I was on the trap nigga doing it like that back in the day, but uh, to be with the motherfuckers. But uh, long story short, I gave the money back to him. I get home, open my backpack, unpacking my shit. Guess what? Back there, the eight grand. <laughs> the eight grand. Another quick story. I was down at um, uh, I forget the club. We was in Atlanta. I think it was uh, Alex, whoever, event. Now I didn't DJ there. Were all over the city, man. But uh. The DJ took some money. <laughs> this is some real shit. I ain't gonna call the names up, but the DJ took some money from him. I was DJing. So it was two big old dudes coming, you know, they little security BMFs. So I was like, what's up? Where that DJ at? They took that money and they played the goddamn BMF song. I was like, I don't know. I was like, there you go. Man, they beat that man out his clothes, put his clothes back on, <laughs> took his clothes back off in the middle of the floor, butt naked. Why the club going on? And I'm looking like security was just standing there and do nothing, dog. That's how the mob was. After they drug him out, beat him up, the ambulance came, got it, the party continued. 
That's a quick story about BMF for real. <laughs> Good God <laughs> about it. I didn't see it. I can't tell it all, but y'all got to wait till that book come out. But, uh, man, love to y'all, man. OG legend DJ Hershey for real. It's official, man. I put my stamp on it, man. And don't never question shit I say because I tell the truth, man. Signing out for real. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> that is what's up, boy.